Honored guests, colleagues, and friends all. There is an old tradition in the AAG that many of you will know about, which is placing bets on the length of the past president's address. So if any of you still indulge in that practice, the betting window is about to close. <laughs> it is with the deepest honor, respect, and delight that I introduce to you tonight Professor Kenneth Foote. Honored for his capacity as past president of the AAG, but who has also served and enriched the discipline of geography in many, many ways. Ken completed his PhD at the University of Chicago, began teaching at the University of Texas at Austin in 1983, and moved to the University of Colorado Boulder in 2000. His research contributions are broad and extensive. They include work in cartography and geographic information science, particularly internet-based applications, American and European landscape history, which focuses on public memory and commemoration, and issues of geography and higher education, particularly instructional technologies and professional development for early career faculty. I've read Ken's work. The concept of landscape in many forms permeates his work and includes questions of how events of violence and tragedy are marked or not marked in the landscape and how contentious debates over how to commemorate, how to interpret, and how to represent the past can expose deep divides in society. And he writes about those deep divides with great aplomb. Such Sites have included the commemoration of African American, Chinese American, Japanese American, and Jewish American historical sites, as well as heritage tourism and historical GIS. And he has a wonderful blend of methods and approaches in the way in which he does his work. Ken's major book on shadowed ground depicts sites across America where civil discord has erupted into violence, suppression, and marginalization. And although I would never recommend a book just for the pictures, <laughs> this is a richly illustrated text uh, that shows the power of landscape representation, which is at the heart of much of geography, in the hands of a very skilled geographer. And Ken and I have worked together close by with over a number of occasions over the past years. And often, Ken would arrive a couple of days early to one of our meetings, rent a car, camera in hand, and uh, go off to inspect some shadowed ground. And unfortunately, there are still many shadowed grounds in America, and Ken has walked them all. Ken's work in the geography of education has been a beloved labor. He's led a number of instructional materials development projects, uh, especially web-based materials, and these include, I'm sure you'll be familiar with, the Geographer's Craft Project, the Virtual Geography Department Project, which was funded by the NSF, Virtual Geography, uh, sorry, um, the Geography Faculty Development Alliance, uh, which provides professional development opportunities for early career faculty, and he's co-PI on the AAG's Enhancing Departments in Graduate Education, or EDGE, project also funded by NSF. And I suspect that there are many in the room who have participated in Ken's workshops and whose careers have been in enhanced thereby. He served as president of the National Council for Geographic Education and has been honored with the AAG's Gilbert Grosvenor Award for Geographic Education in 2005. With his wife, Isabel, Ken performs early music on several instruments and cares for twin sons, Andrew and Douglas, as well as a wonderful, loving American foxhound named King. I salute one of the finest citizens in geography. His contribution is not only vast and erudite in his scholarship, but also in his manner of communication his mentoring, and his care for his colleagues and for his craft. Past President Ken Foote.
One of the great pleasures of serving as an officer of the AAG has been working not only with the council, but the officers. And I've gained so much from working with Audrey over the last couple of years. It's been a delight. I, I didn't realize that I would be back here in New York. Um, I was first in, my first AAG meeting was the New York meeting in 1976. And I didn't expect to be here, to be in front of you when we met here this year. But what I'd like to do in the next 30 or 35 minutes is touch very briefly on three points. I'd like to focus attention on this theme of building community and changing culture by drawing attention to the issue, first of all, of geography's position these days, I think, in a world of opportunities. But I'd like to touch more today on the issues of how we can capitalize on our success so far and look ahead to the future in new and interesting ways. And I'd also like to follow that up and talk a little bit about ways we might be able to sustain that momentum long to the future. What I'm hoping to do this evening then is tie together some of the themes of other past presidents who've stressed the value of geography and the way that we can build upon our success. I think that in part, in order to move outward, we sometimes have to look inward. As a cultural, geography, uh, cultural geographer, I've been particularly interested in the way that we reprodu reproduce our professional practice, how we reproduce our values and norms in our, in our training, our education, our graduate education, and so on. But my question in part is how our traditions sometimes may help or hinder change, and how we sometimes have to question those assumptions that lie behind our professional life. In some ways, I'm interested in whether our disciplinary culture is well suited to respond to the current opportunities and challenges that we face in the world around us, both as a discipline, but more generally, our perspective on world events. I think that one of the reasons I can ask these questions is I feel, like my uh, friend Alec Murphy, that we really are experiencing a renaissance of geography in a world of new opportunities. I just wanted to reinforce some of the points that Alec made just a few years ago in his statement in the Journal of Geography and Higher Education about geography's place in higher education. And in that article, Alec stressed the fact that there seems to be a rising awareness of geography's relevance to a wide range of issues across society. There certainly, as we know, an exploding interest in GI science and its power in an analytic in, a, in, in so many different areas. But we're also seeing, I think, an expanding job market for our graduates at all levels. And I think that's a very important trend that we need to build upon. We're seeing that in advances in pre-college geography. We're seeing that especially in the rise of AP human geography, which has gone from just a few thousand test takers uh, a decade ago to what is it now? Nearly 80,000 expected this, this year, which is a tremendous success. Pardon? 85,000. 85, Thanks, Jody. Um, <laughs> I think also we're seeing a greater scholarly and scientific awareness of geography's potential contributions across a broad spectrum of, of areas. I think one of the great pleasures of serving as president is being able to go out and visit regional meetings, to go to departments and so on, and just to see the range of projects that geographers are involved in, projects with a census, uh, an, uh, project now to get started with a NIH-wide GIS uh, spatial infrastructure project. We see geographers cropping up in discussions of human rights, like this screen capture from the Amnesty International website. But in areas like geocomputation, climate choices, and so on, all of these issues are ones in which geographers are making some fundamental contributions in taking leadership roles. But I also think that people are seeing the relevance of geography in business, in government, in nonprofit organizations. And so we're seeing even more of our graduates going on into these areas. And I think one of the best summaries that I can point to for some of these great challenges and opportunities comes from the National Research Council report that was published two years ago, Understanding the Changing Planet where these 13 grand challenges are grouped into four major categories. And I think it's really exciting because these are really issues that we're facing uh, having to do with understanding and responding to environmental change, how to promote sustainability, how to recognize and cope with the rapid spatial reorganization of economy and society, and finally, how to leverage technological change for the benefit of society and environment. And I think this brings together many of the key points about the contributions that geography can make across the sciences and scholarship. But I think we're also seeing renewed engagement along a whole host of intellectual frontiers. 
On the right, we see some of the efforts by the AAG, the Geo-Humanities book that was published last year, also envisioning landscapes, or for example, the rise in incredible interest these days in historical GIS. I've put in that screen capture from David Rumsey's map collection to kind of highlight this popular interest in maps, geography, and so on, tremendous things that are beginning to emerge in the web, but even going further afield in the recent up rise of interest in the spatial humanities, or even things as far removed as deathscapes there. So I think that we're seeing an expansion in the range of things that we are engaged with. But I'd also point to the, point, the part that we are seeing workforce trends in our favor. In a recent study by Michael Solom, Ivan Chung, and Beth Schlemper that appeared in The Professional Geographer in 2008, they interviewed not only recent graduates of geography programs at, at all levels, but they also interviewed a wide range of employer organizations to ask them what they were looking for in geography graduates. And I think it's very striking because if you look at the diagram on the right, the one that stretches to the top of the slide, it says these are skill areas in which the uh, graduates of our programs are saying that they're using in their positions. And on the left-hand side of that, that column, that inverted pyramid, there are geography skills, and then on the other side, the general skill area. And it's very interesting because it isn't just GI science or cartography at the top. These, these alums are saying that they're, in, they're using their skills in spatial thinking, interdisciplinary perspectives, GIS cartography, but field methods, human environment interaction, and so on, right on down the line. These are the sorts of skills, I think, that we're teaching in our classes, and I think are so important to the future of geography. And in fact, the table nine there that I have in the lower part of the foil highlights some of the skills that the employers are looking for in our graduates. And you will see, of course, GIS and cartography near the top of the list in higher education, government, nonprofit, and um, for-profit companies. But you also will notice there that there are a number of other things like human environment interaction, spatial thinking, field methods, and so on that are highlighted right across the board. So I think there's great potential. I think also we're very fortunate because the AAG itself has responded to this change. I think we can really owe a debt of thanks to Doug Richardson here to my left for really keeping us center stage in this debate. Doug, I think, has initiated a whole host of new and very inclusive initiatives across the whole discipline, all of the areas that I've described earlier. We also benefit from a very strong regional organization with very strong leaders right across the country in our nine regional divisions. We have increasing impact and growth in our publication. Growing membership is, is continuing to grow. We have, like here in New York, very interesting and engaging meetings which are bringing in uh, a large number of geographers um, from outside of the United States. But I think most importantly in looking to the future, an AAG that has very strong and sustainable finances to keep these kinds of projects moving into the future. With that said though, I think we face a host of challenges and opportunities. I've put kind of a cloud of words out here to capture some of the threats <laughs> that, that people are writing about when you turn to the Chronicle of Higher Education or you look at a journal in education. People are talking about the impacts of globalization, the uses of learning technology and its impact, pressures to increase accountability, issues of diversity, the, the, how do we raise completion rates and so forth, a whole range of issues there. And I think <clears throat> I find it interesting that in a recent editorial um, in the Geographical Journal, Noel Castry raised this issue because in some cases English geography is, is facing many of these issues right now. With a change of governments, there's a dramatic, dramatic change. The subject centers which supported geography are gone. There's been a dramatic cut, changing in the way that the funding formulas are working in the UK. And it's interesting because in that editorial toward the end, Noel Castry raises a point I think that goes to the heart of my next suggestion. He says in responding to current pressures, he remarks, we could, we could do something that doesn't come easily to many academics, namely to join forces and to take some preemptive measures in the common interest rather than the interests of individual universities and separate lobby groups. And I think this message about rethinking what we do as a discipline lies at the heart of my message this evening. I think there are at least six areas where we can make some important contributions in terms of changing the culture of our 
discipline in important ways, very important ways that are relatively small steps in that direction. They involve improving support for early career geographers, thinking beyond the academy and looking at that very seriously, supporting international faculty and students, addressing the issue of work life, the nexus, meeting the needs of contingent faculty, and also strengthening department leadership. I think that, as you know, I feel that it very strongly about the need to improve support for our early career faculty. My quote here is from the Chronicle of Higher Education, but it really captures the essence of what I've been driving at in many workshops over the last 11 years. Many newly hired staff arrive in their first jobs without feeling that they're really effectively prepared in their graduate school for such key duties as teaching undergraduates and conducting research. And I think this stems, we have to question some of the assumptions that are built into our discipline. This notion of sink or swim, either people have the talent or they don't, and if they don't have the talent, they should leave. Well, gosh, that is kind of questionable because lots of people who have the talent and can make important contributions to our field may find that that sort of frustration with the current system, not for reasons of their intellectual ability, but simply because they don't get enough help early in their career. I think that we already know some of the steps toward better practice. Better professional development is building that into the training in departmental and disciplinary life. It also means looking very carefully at the way our professional and personal lives intersect. It's not one or the other, but oftentimes we need to consider those together in balance and how they intersect and complement or interconnect with one another. Networking and mentoring like we're seeing here this week are very, very important, but also professional development I think should be seen as a lifelong career spanning process. And those are many of the ideas that uh, Jan Monk, Michael Solom, and I tried to incorporate into our edited volume, Aspiring Academics. I think though the more that I've worked in this area, the more I've begun to question even some of my own assumptions. And I think that many of the norms of our professional life are very, they're implicit. They're part of what we might call a hidden curriculum in graduate training or even undergraduate training. They're the norms and values that we're expected to pick up from our teachers or advisors. If we don't pick them up, we don't have the skills often that we need to survive. But I think there's nothing wrong with having a hidden curriculum. There are lots of professions where there are hidden curricula in law and medicine and so forth. But I do question a hidden curriculum if access to that implicit knowledge is somehow broken off because of a person's gender, sexuality, age, family status, nationality, personal characteristics that are completely irrelevant to academic performance. That is, we really need to question or expose this hidden curriculum so that people with talent who can succeed are given the help that they need. I think down at the bottom of the slide, my point then is that really making this implicit knowledge explicit can really enfranchise a wider range of geographers and attract a greater variety of students and open the discipline to a much wider array of voices than in the past. So I think it's very important, but we have to keep thinking beyond the academy. Some of the issues that I've tried to focus on over the last few years are focusing on people moving into academic careers. But here's a quote as well from, a, from another source. Often the goals of students are very different from the goals and intentions with which they're being prepared. In some cases, students may not be expressing these goals openly to advisors and mentors with whom they're working most closely because faculty don't acknowledge that there's a wider array of careers that people are going into. I think that very often we need to make sure that our training, undergraduate, graduate, and so on, is aligned with what's happening out there in the workforce. We're seeing more and more PhD masters, and particularly, of course, at the bachelor's level, moving off into all sorts of careers in business, government, nonprofit organizations. And we need to take, uh, we need to be aware of that in order to build and to sustain community in ways that support our recent graduate. The new book, Practicing Geography, is an effort to try and redress some of these issues by calling attention to what we can do in this area. I think, too, we need to look at how we can support international students and faculty. We are now at the stage in American geography where about 32% of the faculty in the United States come from outside of the United States. It's a remarkable contribution that's made by people who are coming into the United States to teach. It's interesting because this group of migrants are very different from the ones that were coming through geography when I was starting in my graduate program, which were largely English language geographers from Commonwealth countries in the UK. 
It's interesting now because we're having migrants coming in from all parts of the world. There are men, women, people coming from all areas of geography. And I think that changes the picture a little bit because oftentimes when I talk with leaders, department chairs and other faculty, they say, but I'm always equal. You know, I always treat my, my faculty fairly. I'm, you know, I, I try and be honest. But I, my point is that when we're focusing on some of these issues having to do with supporting international faculty and students, equal isn't always fair. Some people don't have access to the resources needed for even things like visas and for access to grant funding and so forth. So this is, I think, a big issue that we need to look at, just like the next one, which is looking very carefully at the work-life nexus. I think I've become very interested in this over the last few years because we're seeing a tremendous change, or we've seen a tremendous change over the last two decades. Most of the policies in place in our universities still assume that we have married couples, oftentimes um, families with children and so forth, where we have caregivers and people who are working and so on, and that's just not the nature of the U.S. workforce anymore. And I think that we need to begin to address this more systematically within geography if we're going to see some of the changes that we need to um, make in order to support our change in the future. Finally, in the last two categories here, it's meeting the needs of contingent faculty. So we're already at the stage now in the United States where about 48% of the teaching at doctoral and research universities is done by contingent faculty who are working semester by semester or year by year. Across the United States in higher education as a whole, it's 68% of the teaching is done by contingent faculty who oftentimes have no rights and no say in department governance. And in fact, they do oftentimes don't even have access to things like travel travel funds to come to meetings like this. I think we need to be honest about what's happening in this contingent workforce and we need to address these honestly in order to keep our uh, discipline moving forward. And then finally, I think the importance of strengthening leadership training so that we have people coming through from the very beginning. Here I have a photograph of one of the Geography Faculty Development Alliance workshops in Boulder, which I hope will be a group of leaders of the future. But I think we need to go a little bit further beyond this because some of the things I've mentioned now I think are things that we can manage, things we can do within our own programs or within the discipline as a whole. But I think to sustain the momentum and go further we need to think larger than this. We need to think about ways of cultivating large-scale collaborative research. As I was working on this presentation I was flying out of Chicago and I saw these giant crop circles over Batavia, Illinois. And many of you recognize the, um, the Fermi nuclear lab, um, which is just west of Chicago. But it dawned on me, because this really kind of captures this point, there are projects in geography, like the NCGIA, and other projects in the natural sciences and physical geography that involve large-scale collaborations. But I think for many of the most important issues that we face today, the effects of globalization, climate change, adaptation, and so forth, we really should be thinking of ways in which we can build those kind of large-scale collaborations. I think this book, Grand Challenges in the Environmental Sciences, really makes me think of the ways that we need to look at these issues very seriously, but we need to focus on them using these interdisciplinary, large-scale collaborative approaches, which somehow, somehow they, they're a little bit hard for us to organize. I also think that we need to take seriously, as many of us are doing in this meeting, of the collaborative learning and teaching across institutions. I, I put up just a collage here of some of the efforts going out these days. I'm thinking of the fact that the Khan, the, the, the Khan Academy is out there now drawing thousands of visitors using open educational resources. Esri now offers more, um, cr more credit hours or rather instructional hours of GI science than any university um, in the world. We also find incredibly rich uh, open educational resources like Wikipedia, the geography publishers, uh, Wiley, Pearson, so on are offering exceptionally good materials out in the web. And we're already beginning to see how the classrooms are breaking down in some areas like GI science, or as this uh, newspaper article from the New York Times by Daphne Kohler points out, is that artificial intelligence offers the incredible opportunities in online and distance education to personalize, to customize, to give context-dependent help 
in new and interesting ways. And I think really we're working on that at the moment, kind of department to department, course by course. And I think that there is a good opportunity presently to begin to think of ways that we can focus on that more widely across the discipline. These issues of institutional change, of, of disciplinary change, of the culture of institution has led me off into the literature that has to do with organizational learning, with the social life of, of, or of, of information, into some of the management literature, which is very rich and focuses on the, the issues of how to cultivate change, of how to, how to, how to uh, learn from organizations and sort of focus on organizational structures. And from this literature, there a couple, one area that I found particularly useful. It's, of course, the issue of developing communities of practice. It is groups of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic, and who deepen their knowledge and expertise in this area by interacting on an open basis. To me, at least, this notion of community of practice is really taking the notion of academic life and applying it to organizations like businesses that need to be able to cultivate knowledge and propagate it from unit to unit and generation to generation. Really, it's taking an idea about academic life, which we already do, and applying it to a business world. But at the same time, I think this idea of community and practice is very useful to bring back over to academics because I do think it helps to clarify other opportunities because in many of the areas where people have found the community of practice idea particularly valuable are in areas where we have um, to make connections across distances and across institutions. So I think there's some value in bringing this notion of uh, communities of practice back to the academic world to highlight some of the things that we might do to build community and make changes in our culture. Etienne Wenger, who's one of the leading theorists in this area of communities of practice, stresses the notion of how we can build these kinds of communities across distance, across institutions. He stresses the notion of building on existing knowledge and networks rather than reinventing the wheel, but also opening the dialogue between inside and outside, between practitioners and academics and so forth, but also inviting different levels of participation, but also trying to develop both public and private communities of practice, much like we're trying to do even in these meetings, but also then finally focusing on the value to the community and community members. But you know, when I make presentations like this around the country, I always get people who say, well, you know, I don't know, well, maybe we'll do this, maybe not. And I think there are reasons for caution. Oftentimes people will say, well, look, you've just told us. We're doing great. We're, we're doing fine. Why, why do anything different, you know? Why rock the boat at this point? Because you've just shown us how geography has been growing over the last decade. I think one of my favorites, though, and I hear quite often is, I didn't have these opportunities when I was growing up. And look at me. Look at me. I remember one of my mentors saying that. And I also think I've heard people say, well, we're, to, to spur real change, we need a critical approach. I was sitting in a panel a few years ago, and someone said, we should throw away the whole university and start over. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, well, that would be seven or 800 years of good ideas we could, we could throw away. But also the fourth point is that sometimes people will say, well, let's wait until things settle down. You know, this, you know, this is a period of rapid change, and maybe we should just wait until things settle down. But I think the fifth, fifth one is also a good one, which is universities and, and, and disciplines are really among the longest lived institutions in Western cultures. And many people would, would date them as coming before the, the limited liability company. I mean, they, they really are a very um, long lasting institution. So if they're so long lasting, you know, why, why worry? You know, we're, we're gonna survive the current downturn. But I think there are some reasons that matter. And these are reasons that go beyond the jobs now, or the universities now, or this department, or that department, and so on. I think that I would um, wager that almost everyone here in the room feels that geography offers some important scientific and scholarly perspectives on a wide range of very important research questions relating to space, place, and environment. That's what comes through so clearly in the meetings. We have something to offer. Our discipline has something to offer. And acting now and focusing on some of these issues allows us to guide and to shape this change rather than simply react to it when problems crop up. 
I think indeed universities are among the oldest lived institutions in the West, but that doesn't mean that they haven't changed substantially. And we are going through one of those changes right now, and it's our opportunity now in, in terms of even some of the alliances we're building here at this session with China and elsewhere, we're seeing these changes occur, and this is the time when we begin, can begin to shape things. So let me bring things all together as I finish up. I think <clears throat> that I raise these issues because I think we're in the midst of a period of tremendous opportunities and challenges. In coming years, we're gonna be faced with continuing impacts of globalization and changing dynamics of the knowledge economy and expected rise in career opportunities for geographers, but a downturn in funding for their education. We're gonna see the rapid evolution and deployment of learning technologies especially for distance education, the rise of for-profit colleges and universities, and a wide change in trends in public support for higher education. I think confronting these changes will require looking outward, but also very much looking inward to the ways we can build a stronger community of practice, of practice across the entire discipline. I began this talk by stressing how much geography as a discipline has accomplished in recent years. I think we will always know geographers for what we contribute to science and scholarship and so on. But my conclusion really is that we can accomplish even more by building community and changing culture now rather than later because this will be essential to our work and the small changes we can make at this point I think will offer some real rewards in the future. Thank you very much. Can I thank you? Clearly everyone in the room thanks you and the discipline thanks you for the, the support and strength that, that you have given uh, to geography that really does make a difference. Now, one of the uh, duties of the retiring president uh, is to make a recommendation and award the Presidential Achievements Awards, one of our highest recognitions to members of the discipline for the work that they have contributed. Uh, Ken Foote has decided to make two awards uh, to two very important people in our discipline, and I would like to invite him back to the podium to carry out this task. Tonight, I'm pleased to be able to honor two, ge two of geography's most remarkable scholars, Professor Laura Polito of the University of Southern California and Don Wright of Oregon State University in Esri. Both are to receive the 2012 AAG Presidential Achievement Award. Not only are doctors Polito and Wright's research, researchers of exceptional achievement, but their work highlights the remarkable breadth and diversity of contemporary geography through working in, though working in very different fields, their work shows how geography can engage important topics across the social and natural sciences. But also, they make a contribution to broader public debate on critical social, environmental, and geographical issues. First, I'd like to, like to present the award to Professor Polito. Professor Polito researches race, political activism, ethnic studies in Los Angeles. She studies how various groups experience racial and class oppression, how these experiences differ among particular communities of color, and how they mobilize to create a more socially just world. Asking such questions, Professor Polito has done extensive work in the areas of environmental justice, radical movements of the 60s and 70s, labor studies, alternative tourism, and comparative ethnic studies. Currently, she has three forthcoming books, A People's Guide to LA, co-written with Laura Baraclaw and Wendy Cheng. It's an alternative tour guide I'm interested in that highlights sites of racial, class, gender, and environmental struggle in LA County's history and landscape. 
<clears throat> Second, she's co-editor along with Josh Kuhn of Black and Brown LA, an edited volume that explores the relationships between Latinas, Latinos, and African Americans in Southern California. And finally, she is co-editor of Racial Formation in the 21st Century, which revisits Michael Almy and Howard Winant's influential text, Racial Formation in the United States. In, in addition, she is researching the history and geography of Latina, Latino, especially ethnic Mexicans, racial identity, particularly in relationship to whiteness. She is also working to complete several projects left by her recently deceased friend and colleague, Clyde Woods. Congratulations. This is really cool. <laughs> it's great to be honored by one's uh, peers and one's colleagues from one's work. We all know we do this work out of passion and our commitment to changing the world as well. It's what we love. It's why we do it, right? Um, and I just want to thank all the, particularly my teachers, Margaret Fitzsimmons, Diana Liverman, and always my fairy godmother, Jan Monk. Thanks. I'd like to present the second award to Dawn Wright. Would you like to come up? Dr. Wright's research interests include geographic information science, ocean informatics, and cyber infrastructure, as well as benthic terrain and habitat characterization, the tectonics of mid-ocean ridges, and the interpretation of high-resolution bathymetry and underwater videography and photography. She's completed oceanographic field work in some of the most geologically active regions of the planet, including the East Pacific Rise, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Juan de Fuco Ridge and the Tonga Trench, as well as volcanoes under the Japan Sea and Indian Ocean. Dr. Wright's recent books include Coastal Informatics, Web Atlas Design and Implementation, which he co-edited with Ned Dwyer and Val Cummings in 2011, Arc Marine, GIS for Blue Planet, which he co-authored with Michael Blogdowitz, uh, Pat Halpin, and Joe Bremen in 2007, Place Matters, Geospatial Tools for Marine Science, Conservation, and Management in the Pacific Northwest, which she co-edited with Astrid Schultz in 2005, Undersea with GIS in 20, 2002, and Marine and Coastal Geographic Information Systems, co-edited with Darius Bartlett in the year 2000. Dawn was recently appointed Chief Scientist at ESRI, in this position, she aids in formulating and advancing the intellectual and scientific agenda for the environmental, conservation, climate, and ocean science aspects of ESRI's work, while also representing ESRI within the national and international scientific communities. Wright is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and among her numerous awards are an NSF career grant and the 2007 U.S. Professor of the Year for the State of Oregon from the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, CASE. Congratulations.
I'm uh, quite stunned. Uh, Ken Foote has been a hero of mine for, for many years, going back to the uh, virtual geography days, and I've followed him for so many years as a role model, so to be receiving uh, an award uh, from him and from the association here is uh, just really wonderful. And it's a double honor to receive this with another one of my heroines, Laura Polito, because I remember, Laura, when I visited USC and stayed at your house and uh, gave a talk at your department and, and saw all of the wonderful um, things happening at USC. After having read all of your environmental justice papers, I wanted to get your autograph and I never did, so I'll do that afterwards. <laughs> so uh, this is, uh, again, really wonderful. And uh, my thanks to the AAG, which has uh, sustained, uh, sustained me and given me wonderful colleagues over the years. And, I thank all of my uh, colleagues and students at Oregon State University, and I have uh, so many new colleagues and, and friends at, at Esri. Uh, actually, I've had friends at Esri over the years. Now I get to, to really work with them, which is uh, wonderful. And uh, I agree that uh, geography is really in a good place now. And it's wonderful that many people, when they think of geography, they think of the 70% of the planet now as well, which is a very important part of our world. Thank you. Thank you.